Dear viewers, many thanks for joining us. This is our weekly program, Diplomacy and Amulka Mandamu, by hosting and producing this program for you. Today, I've joined by Lin Cholata, a senior and prominent Ethiopian Oromo politician. Many thanks for joining me. Thanks for inviting me. Well, just to begin with, how can you express the Oromo people's struggle starting from the base to now? Well, a continuous challenge. Uh, a challenge internally in Ethiopia and from the neighboring countries. Uh, the Oromo national struggle started as soon as we were subjugated. Initially, it was conducted on a localized, sporadic manner. And in the 1960s, it started assuming a centralized nature. One must remember that uh, the Oromo Liberation Front emerged from the student movement of the 1960s. Within the student movement, the major debate was whether Ethiopia is confronting a class uh, question or a national question. The Oromos, Oromo, some Oromo intellectuals took the uh, unique stand that as far as the Oromo is concerned, both class issues and national issues were fused. So we uh, launched a national liberation struggle drawing on class analysis. Why was this necessary? It is all connected on how we were conquered uh, at the end of the 19th century, early uh, 20th century. When Oromia was conquered and uh, included in the Ethiopian state, land was completely taken away from Oromos except one third and given to members of the uh, conquering army. One third was taken by the crown. One third was taken by the church. So we were landless. Similarly, as Oromo, as a nation, a plan was drawn up to completely eradicate us as a group. Uh, first, by impoverishing us. Secondly, by uh, adopting policies that worked on gradually undoing elements of Romo identity, language, culture, history. These all were disparaged. And uh, the early work of the nationalists was combating these uh, policies. This was the struggle that was being conducted inside Ethiopia. At the same time, uh, Mohamed Siabarre's expansionist Somalia uh, targeted half of Oromia for incorporation into Greater Somalia. They invented a new nationality called Somali Abbo and started harassing Oromo nationalists, including inside Oromia. By the way, more uh, leaders of the OLF were killed by Somali uh, uh, insurgents than by the Dark regime. And this set us back years. We had to fight a triangular warfare in the east. From the front, we fought uh, Dirk. At the back, we fought uh, the Siad, uh, Siad Barre's agents. To avoid this complication, we had to launch a new theater of operation in Western Oromia, hoping that we will not have this complication anymore border in Sudan. 
within two years of our uh, armed struggle starting, the Derg prepared a new obstacle for us, uh, the Sudan People's Liberation Army was deployed exactly to coincide with the base area that we were building. And for the next six years, from 1984 to 1990, again we had to fight on two fronts. Uh, from the front, Derg, uh, from our rear, the Sudan People's Liberation Army. With the Sudan People's Liberation Army, we went to great extent to avoid any conflict. We were not opposed to the cause of the Southern Sudanese, and they had no reason to oppose our effort to throw off uh, oppression. And so as a result of all these internal and external complications, uh, the Oromo struggle did not advance as much as it should have. And by the late 1980s, the Northern forces, uh, EPLF and TPLF, had put together a plan to overthrow the Derg and replace it. And we were still at the stage of developing institutions. They already were government in waiting. When we came into the transitional government, it was a struggle of unequals. They were much prepared, much or better organized. And uh, the result was that we became a casualty. In short, this is the story. After the transitional period in Ethiopia, uh, how, how can you express the role of Ethiopian political parties, especially the role of Oromo political parties? Well, you see, the OLF had already scored a number of breakthroughs. First, the creation of the re Oromo region called Oromia was negotiated before the transitional government was uh, even came into being. The use of Oromo language uh, as a medium for uh, education, for uh, the uh, delivery of uh, judiciary and health services was already decided. And we had been preparing Oromo literature using the Latin alphabet and in Afan Oromo. What the OPDO did was simply copy what we have done and continue to implement it. The other uh, situation that uh, crystallized over time was that the TPLF's agenda was unworkable. We could have actually cut the dominance of the TPLF uh, much shorter if we had been creative, both those who are in the EPRDF, nationalist elements in the EPRDF, and those of us who are in the OLF. Uh, what do I mean by that? There is a contradiction in EPRDF's approach to governance. Ormos are supposed to be self-governing, but those who govern Ormos are picked by the TPLF. This is a contradiction that can only lead to a lot of conflict. Eventually, in, after the 2015 elections, this started to manifest itself. And within the OPDO itself, those who were dissatisfied with the role allocated to them, in collaboration with activists and uh, young Oromo uh, protesters, started eroding the system. And the end was the 2018 change, in which the TPLF uh, lost dominance and withdrew to Tigray. At this time, there is no stable, or the situation in Ethiopia, especially the political situation in Ethiopia, is 
non-stop. So how, how, how can the government of Ethiopia come in this situation? The key for me is stabilizing Oromia. If you stabilize Oromia, it's the largest and the most populous member of the federation. Uh, the rest, stabilizing the rest of Ethiopia would be much easier. It is impossible to stabilize the rest of Ethiopia while Oromia is destabilized. And in order to stabilize Oromia, political actions are necessary and some law enforcement activities are also necessary. Uh, the key is how do Oromos view the present government? On this Oromos, Oromo public must reach a consensus. And uh, very soon I hope we will start a discussion throughout Oromia on these basic issues. Uh, the instability in this country results from how the politics is polarized. There are three branches in Ethiopia's political alignment right now. One group, uh, we can call it unitarists, would like to revive the order of yesteryears. Some groups want to simply democratize the multinational federation, and there are those who would like to depart from Ethiopia, separate and create their own independent state. They may be quiet now, but that does not mean they have abandoned their agenda of uh, separating from Ethiopia. The stand of the unitarists and of the separatists reinforces each other. The more unitarists uh, become very vocal, the more separatists despair on achieving any kind of justice within the Ethiopian state. These two work on each other. One builds the legitimacy of the other. The middle ground democratizing uh, the current multinational federation is the compromise position to which I subscribe, which I believe is achievable and will uh, once and for all put Ethiopia on a stable democratic course. Well, how the government of Ethiopia can, you know, join those things or uh, can resolve this situation, especially in resolving the three uh, unitary federalists and the democratizing the na na current uh, multinational, how the government of Ethiopia can resolve this situation? This is not the responsibility of the government alone. It is the responsibility of all of us. If we really care about this country to uh, very strongly and vocally express our preferences. And I hope the majority of Ethiopians will choose merely democratizing the uh, multinational federation, restoring the unitary order of yesteryears is simply impossible. I think our brothers who are uh, brothers and sisters who are advocating it should really re-examine this agenda of theirs and its implications. Uh, once a system exhausted itself, it cannot be revived. They make a very important mistake. They blame TPLF for restructuring Ethiopia as a multinational federation. Yeah, TPLF was uh, in a uh, position of leadership when this happened, but the idea was not restricted to the TPLF. We came up with the idea that was originally enshrined in the Charter. Today, many of the southern nations back the multinational federation. 
And if the unitarists are really serious about preserving Ethiopia's unity, they should soft pedal their advocacy of return of the order of yesteryears. Can the Gada system, the Oromo uh, traditional governance, be a solution for the Ethiopian's politics and its Oromo politics? Do you believe that? Let us start with the Oromo. Because uh, we claim we have a democratic tradition, democratic legacy, unlike our northern uh, previous masters, both of them. They come from a long history of autocratic rule. But then we behave exactly like them. We should be honest and accept democratic values. Most of the democratic values, and we can list them, are part and parcel of the Gada system. Declaring your support for Gada and practicing it are two different things. Certain uh, cultural, uh, political cultural characteristics that we developed over the last 100 years must be uh, thrown overboard in order to revive Gada. And our scholars must look at Gada and see how we can modernize it, fit it into modern democratic political uh, system. Once we have done that, once we have successfully integrated Gada into modern political uh, thought and modern political practice, we will become a towering example for the whole of Africa. And this is what makes it very challenging, because anything that is that important cannot be achieved very easily. What kind of work should be undertaken, especially in civilizing and modernizing the understanding of the people about politics? We have to conduct repeated educational uh, forums in various parts of Oromia in particular. Uh, we have to engage the public. We have to uh, listen to the public and return uh, and honor their views. Uh, and this is a very difficult job. It requires patience, it requires resources. Some of us are entertaining launching such a process uh, in the near future. Whether we'll succeed or not, time will tell. Well, in general, what kind of political system that you suggest for the people like Ethiopia, where multinational people are living together? Democracy. Democracy in which both individual rights and group rights are upheld. Uh, and once you say that, the merely copying liberal democracy may not work. We will have to be creative and fit a political order that suits our situation and the situation of our communities. Well, how do you recognize the reform launched almost three and a half years in Ethiopia? The reform has come a long way, but it is confronting many challenges. Some of these challenges are understandable. Some are imposed upon it. Uh, the reform itself uh, was very challenging from the very outset. But then unexpected complicating factors uh, started interfering with it. Uh, one, the arrival of uh, COVID-19 itself was a very complicating factor. Before we could uh, overcome that, uh, locust crossed the Red Sea and started invading uh, large parts of uh, East Africa. While we were dealing with that, violent conflict broke out in the north. These are all uh, negative 
these all have negative consequences for our economy, which was already struggling. And it is time to uh, join ranks, put our internal differences aside, and overcome this uh, unexpected uh, externally imposed challenges. What, what, what kind of additional reforms that you suggest? Uh, additional reform, then reform, it's an, an early stage. And reform cannot happen overnight. It takes time to build institutions and to forge appropriate political culture. In this country, transition to democracy has failed repeatedly in the past for a number of reasons. One of them is the lack of institutions. In, by institutions, people think of an electoral board, a civil service, a judiciary that is in, uh, autonomous. Yeah, these are important. For me, the most important is political parties that are democratic. The big problem with Ethiopia is that the concept of political party is not understood, is not appreciated. Political parties are mechanisms for aggregating societal uh, aspirations, wishes, views, and interests. When we have over 100 political groups, it means we are not aggregating societal views into manageable few uh, positions from which the electorate will choose. So we have a long way to go. We have to form internally democratic political parties. Parties that are not internally democratic cannot practice democracy in the uh, external arena. I think that is the major challenge. And in order to do this, perhaps we need to conduct educational uh, processes to make people conscious of the shortcomings of political groups in Ethiopia and also draw up the appropriate legal instruments for uh, channeling the politics of this country in the direction of the formation of democratic political parties. Well, how can you compare and contrast especially the transitional parade led by the EPLF and the uh, reform parade led by Abiy Ahmed? EPLF? EPRDF. Oh. That's so-called Ihadik. EPRDF. EPRDF was effective in obstructing transition to democracy. Uh, that effectiveness lasted for 27 years and came crashing down as a result of the internal contradictions that I mentioned earlier. The opportunity now is very high to transition to uh, democratic order for two reasons. One, this government is widely known to be led by Oromo. And we can leverage Oromo claim that they have a democratic legacy to uh, push them to avoid the same kind of mistakes that were done in the past. Number two, this is the first time that a member of the largest nationality in Ethiopian history has taken the lead. And as a large nation, the Oromo has no reason to fear democratic political order. Minorities fear democracy. Therefore, EPRDF dominated by TPLF that arose from a minority had no interest. In fact, it had more interest 
in aborting transition to democracy than in uh, making an effective transition to democratic uh, to a, to democracy. Well, do you think that the current reform in Ethiopia is holistic, and what was, if not what was, the weaknesses? Uh, I don't know what you mean by holistic. Includes all institutional human power and all things as a general. It should. Is it? That's a question that only time can answer. Uh, but the effort being done under very trying situation is commendable as far as I'm concerned. Uh, all the challenges that I listed before, some of it imposed, some of it uh, emerged from within uh, the political system. And uh, it is a very difficult undertaking and we should be patient. <clears throat> One thing that I would like to underscore again and again that democracy cannot come overnight. It will take time to build institutions, to build the uh, appropriate political culture. So, uh, unfortunately, in this country, we are impatient. We want to fulfill all our agenda at one go. In democracy, you win some, you lose some. Even when you lose, you hope to win next time. This kind of patience is lacking in this country. This Ethiopian people, Ethiopian elite, is very patient when it comes to enduring uh, repression and oppression, but is impatient. Once uh, rights are uh, uh, recognized and upheld, and spoils a lot of things by its own impatience. Let us learn from past experiences and patiently work for an incre incremental advance toward this democratic political order. The government of Ethiopia is planning to undertake the national general election of Ethiopia in this Ethiopian fiscal year. Do you think that this is inappropriate and timely for the current situation of the country? I'll be very frank. I, myself, I do not believe this country is ready for general elections. Because the issues on which we disagree cannot be resolved by conducting general elections. What we disagree about is constitutional. What kind of Ethiopia? What kind of nation is Ethiopia? What kind of people or peoples inhabit Ethiopia? These are basic issues that must be resolved before you go to elections. I know the Prime Minister wants to uh, uh, renew his legitimacy by going through uh, an election. But again, Actors during this transition are becoming increasingly impatient in realizing their, uh, their aspiration. Two groups hate the conduct of uh, general elections while the present order is still in place. Unitaries hate general elections that is conducted while the multinational federation is still in place because it will legitimate it. Separatists who still call Ethiopia an empire had a, a relatively fair and free general elections because it will legitimate the Ethiopian state and they cannot anymore continue to claim that it remains an empire. Looking at all these challenges, I have suggested to uh, officials in this country let us conduct an election to a constitutional assembly and then let's debate the uh, constitution that fits Ethiopia. That may divide us, but it is better to divorce peacefully 
than to go through uh, a, a disruptive breakup. Well, coming to you, parties that you found, what the current situation of ODF, or more democratic front? ODF doesn't exist anymore. When we came home, we signed a memorandum of understanding with then existing ODP. ODP doesn't exist anymore. It has become a prosperity party. And prosperity does not accept new members. So we are in this limbo. We, are not, we neither exist nor have we completely dissolved. And there is a discussion going on by cadres of the former ODF, what to do next. So we will wait and see what decisions they reach. What's your role on the party? When I turned 75, I decided my role as a leader of any political group is over. So at the conclusion of our merger with ODP, with the permission of uh, the leadership of uh, ODF, I have retired. I have retired from formal leadership role. I do the job of an elderly person. I advise uh, groups that are interested. I also do uh, very quiet advocacy on issues that are of interest to me. So who is the current chairperson of the party? As I told you, ODF doesn't exist, so it doesn't have a leader. Well, coming to the current situation of the country, especially on the operation of the Tigray Regional State, what's your overall comments and suggestion? Any violent conflict is regrettable. And in Ethiopia, we do not know how to compromise at the last minute in order to avoid <clears throat> descent into armed confrontation. Armed confrontation is terrible. It destroys life, it de destroys property, and it destroys opportunities. So uh, it's unfortunate that uh, this violent conflict has broken out. I do not want to apportion blame to this side or that side. Uh, but the sooner we get over it, the better. Because the longer it lasts, the more agenda items get added. The more actors uh, try to take uh, opportunity uh, out of the existence of this situation. So my advice to all uh, sides involved, wrap up this and do it in such a way that it does not leave uh, a scar that will be detrimental to the unity of the country. Well, as recommendation, what kind of activities should be undertaken, especially in restoring peace and stability in the region, as well as in uh, rehabilitating the displaced people? What kind of activities, especially done by the government of Ethiopia? Well, from what I hear from the official media of the government, uh, attempts are already underway in order to uh, address the need of the displaced and uh, other war-affected uh, communities, this should be enhanced and continue. This should also be reinforced with political measures. The TPLF, yes, uh, has committed a lot of crimes, but not Lumping all TPLF members together would be wrong. I think the government should discriminate between those who are bent on destabilizing the country and those who are responsible. And very soon, reconstitute a reformed TPLF or its successor 
as a representative of the Tigrayan population. We should never forget that the TPLF may have committed a lot of uh, crimes outside Tigray, maybe even mistreated Tigrayan population, but every family has lost at least one member, one member of each family has been martyred in the struggle conducted by the TPLF. So uh, it is those who, who have better information than I do to weigh these situations and uh, launch the restoration of uh, a reformed, modest, moderate TPLF or it is successor. And the success should be in such a way that change and continuity is upheld. This is my crazy idea. I don't know if it is functional or not. Well, uh, what could be the major challenges of Ethiopia, especially after the now crisis in the country? What could be the major challenges of Ethiopia for the future, in your view? Endless. There are challenges that no matter which government must confront. Population is number one for me. When uh, the last uh, regime government took place in 91, Ethiopia's population was about 50 million. Now it is over 100. Land has not expanded. Water has not increased. Job opportunities have not emerged. So this is a huge burden. And an unemployed, educated, conscious, Youngster is a very dangerous animal. And in order to address this huge challenge, we have to think together, including uh, consultation with the affected youth, and find a way around it. Secondly, we cannot let population growth rate continue to gallop. We have to devise ways and means to put population growth under control. This is huge. This is a very difficult uh, undertaking. And secondly, the economy. The economy was already uh, struggling. Now with the outbreak of war and of the violent conflict and the infestation of uh, uh, locust, the economy will definitely take a hit. How do we revive the economy, economic growth, even to the level that it was before all these complications emerged? I believe uh, I criticized the EPRDF and its leadership on a number of levels. But I believe their choice of the developmental state could be amended and adopted for, uh, for the uh, future of Ethiopia. The, the articulator of the developmental party, Mala uh, Zainawi, I've read some of his uh, production on this issue. He makes a strong case for why the developmental state, developmental party is necessary in Ethiopia. But he makes one fundamental mistake, and that is he believes the autonomy of the state should rest on its control of the army and the police. This is what collapsed in the post-2015 period. I have a different solution for that. Uh, autonomy can come about by embedding the state. And Ethiopia is very close to becoming an embedded state. Once it is embedded, it becomes autonomous, and that way economic development can leapfrog forward 
uh, in a promising way if we support it with other uh, policy choices such as population control. Do you believe that the current, the current constitution of Ethiopia should be changed? And in your view, what's the problem with the constitution? Well, this constitution is a move in the right direction. So I cannot advocate it is scrapping. But any constitution is imperfect. So it requires some amendments. For example, the autonomy of the House of Federation uh, should be established. The independence of the judiciary should be established. Uh, these are the kinds of uh, reforms that I will advocate. Well, coming to political parties' role in Ethiopia, what would be their role at this critical time for the country? Stop destabilizing the country. Stop divisive uh, uh, political rhetoric. Even if they did that, these, just these two, by undoing what they have been doing, they will contribute tremendously. But I'm not very optimistic because uh, we do not have political groups in this country. What we have are prominent individuals and their fans and their followers. And these followers, uh, they rely on winning membership by uh, advocating extremist positions. They are not responsible to society to a social sector in the country. For example, there are political groups that supposedly advocate the right of their nation. There are more than 10 uh, claiming to advocate the interest of the Oromo. The, I know seven that are advocating the interest of the Amhara. And they compete with each other in advocating extreme positions. If they were really committed to uh, the interests of their society, of their constituency, really we do not need all these groups. And they would not also advocate extremist positions because extremism in the end will hurt society. Well, coming to flag issues in Ethiopia, there are contrary issues with the same to their constitution. What's your advice here? How can the government of Ethiopia can match those ideas? My hope is that this will be discussed as part of the amendment of the constitution and we reach a, a compromise but one thing must be very clear. The flag of the church and the flag of the country must be different. For example, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church has appropriated one uh, Ethiopian flag. Once it becomes the flag of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, a large sector of the Muslim population cannot relate to that flag whether they are doing this consciously, knowing that how divisive it is, or they just don't care, I don't understand. Uh, so uh, this has to be discussed uh, when the amendment of the Constitution takes place. I believe we can and we must adopt a new Ethiopian flag that from now on, will not be controversial. I'm almost close to end with my questions. Obolincho, if I have a general message for the people and government of Ethiopia, especially uh, on the current situation of the country, you are highly welcome. Well, I wish uh, this country a lot of good luck. I wish our leadership a lot of good luck. I wish they will put aside their petty differences and join forces in uh, guiding Ethiopia to a new political order, a democratic political order, 
and I would be very happy to contribute to whatever is required of me. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you very much. Well, dear viewers, this will bring us to the end of this edition. Amul Kawandamu. Till the next edition. Have a beautiful time.